Amen. All right, one final time. You guys ready for the mystery thing? Tom, you ready? All right, thank you. All right. Hey, it all started out with great intentions, Ryan. You ready for this? Okay, good. And uh, their government was based on godly principles. Good thing. Their people followed godly principles. Great thing. Even their schools taught godly principles. It was the land of milk and honey, and, and Jesus Christ was honored from sea to shining sea. But decades later, that was soon to change. With a stroke of one pen, prayer was removed from their educational system. With a stroke of another pen, the Bible was uh, banned from reading in their system. And the next thing you know, it actually became a crime to share what was in that book. But that was just the beginning. The fruit of this rebellion didn't take long to manifest itself in this country. After these events took place, violent crimes in this country went up 995%. The inmate population grew from about 200,000 to about 2 million. Unmarried couples living together went up 725%, uh, it says. And then, of course, which led to illegitimate births going up 400%. Then, in this country, a murder began to occur every 23 minutes, a rape every 6 minutes, an aggravated assault every 48 seconds and a burglary every eight seconds but that still wasn't all it got so bad so godless every single day in this country 13 youths committed suicide 16 were murdered 1,000 became mothers every day 100,000 brought guns to school 2,200 dropped out of school 500 began using drugs 1,000 began drinking alcohol 3,500 a day were assaulted 630 were robbed and 80 were raped every single day in fact, it got so wicked so fast, they began to murder their own children just like flies, and in just a few decades, they had annihilated well over 50-some million children. As one guy says, if God doesn't judge this nation, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But you need to read the Bible. God doesn't apologize. The book is now. And the judgment is the future coming judgment unfortunately, on America. Now, folks, the point is this tonight. If we don't think that God is going to judge this wicked behavior in our nation, we have got another thing coming. Apparently, you're reading that uh, Barney version of the Bible with the purple cover. Get rid of it. Okay, get a real Bible, because the real Bible tells you, folks, that God is going to judge this uh, uh, nation of ours. Why? Because we are not repenting, we are not turning from this wicked behavior, and God doesn't play favorites. Old Testament, New Testament, God is a God who will judge sin. It's just a matter of time, okay? We're flirting with fire, okay? And only a revival, a true, genuine revival uh, could turn things around. But here's the point. Once again, you would think then, when God warns us of this, then people would take note and say, hey, man, listen, uh, the common sense point is this. I better get right with God so I don't suffer this coming judgment of God, even here, unfortunately, in America, right? What's the problem? Once again, the little G, the little God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe in God. And that's with the live evolution, amongst other things. Okay, And so now, because of that, our world not only has a hard time believing in God, but even if they want to flirt with the idea that there is a God, one thing they absolutely, adamantly refuse to believe in is that God is a God who will judge. But folks, God judges planet once. He's going to do it again. And so you need to pay attention to that, okay? So in order to help these scoffing people hopefully become smarter people, with all due respect, before it's too late, we're going to continue in our study. That's right, the witness of creation. And what we're doing is taking a look at different evidences that God's left behind for us to show us he's not just real, but the great news is we don't just get to stare at him from afar. We can have a beautiful, loving, intimate, personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Anybody excited about that? Okay, but the tagline is this, before it's too late. Because if you leave this planet, taking your last breath, Without surrendering to Christ, you're going straight to hell, okay? There is an urgency there. And so far, we've seen this first evidence that God's left behind for us, showing us this amazing truth, was the evidence of an intelligent creation or intelligent design. We were designed by God. The second evidence was the evidence of a young creation or young earth. We have not been here for millions and billions of years. The third evidence was the evidence of a special creation, exposing all the lies of evolution. Their mechanisms don't work. Why? Because they're a lie. And they even admit it. We came from the hand of God. And the last 11 times we saw the fourth evidence was the evidence of a judge creation. What's that mean? I.e., guess what? We've been seeing that there really was a worldwide flood. And as we all know, the only reason why the Bible records for us the account of the worldwide flood of Noah was so that we could have some really cool artwork to draw on the mural for kids' walls. It's really flavorful because you get different animals. You got big ones. You got small ones. No, what's the whole point of the flood? It's not just some people survived on a boat. Why did they have to survive on the boat? 
Because God was judging this world. That's what the flood's about. It's about God's judgment against sin. And we've been seeing that uh, not just because the Bible says so, that that's not bad. That's our starting point. Hello, our source of truth, okay? But we've been taking a look at the evidence, okay? And last time we saw that all the Genesis account, not just the flood, but what the Bible talks about is true. And that includes the evidence of giants or giant people, okay? And what we saw there last week, if you were here, was the evidence of giants are recorded for us all over the place, uh, not just in the Bible, but in mythology, in history. And it showed us that, listen, God knows what he's talking about. He doesn't lie like man. You don't need to come up with some whacked out theory. Just stick with the scripture, do your homework, and you're going to see God tells the truth, okay, which is good news. But that's not all. The fourth evidence, there really was a giant people before and after the flood, like the Genesis account says, is the evidence of remains, okay? The evidence of remains. That's an actual photograph. We'll get to that in a little second. How many guys would say that's a pretty big person? That's a railroad car for comparison. That's how big that person is. We'll get to this in just a little bit. But uh, the reason why we bring these remains issue up is because this, to me, is the logical conclusion, uh, even after all we saw. Because you might be saying, okay, so Pastor Billy, so mythology, different cultures around the planet talk about these giants, okay? The Bible mentions many different times, when you actually read it, uh, about giants, okay? Uh, and so, but you would think with all these talk about giants that we'd find some of the remains somewhere, somehow, right? Guess what? You're looking at one of them. We do. And they find them, shocker, all over the world. But before we get to that, let's remind ourselves why we should be finding these things all over the world. Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 9. We're going to take a look at yet another account in the Scripture that there was some really big people before and after the flood, just like the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 9, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteros Namas, the second telling of the law. You ever read Deuteronomy and go, hey, wait a second, I heard this before. That's right, Tom, that's what the book means, the second telling. All right? And as, and, and as we're going to see the context, it's the second telling to the second generation. Okay, That's getting ready to go into the promised land. As we saw last week, the first generation freaked out and were afraid. Why? Because there were grasshoppers, there were giants in the land. Okay, uh, God didn't rebuke them because of their uh, saying that there were giants, because there were. He rebuked them because they didn't trust him to take care of the giants. Okay, as so we saw. But now he's in the Deuteros Nama, second telling of the law, Deuteronomy, the second generation. God had to wait for the first one to die off. Now he's giving it round two. You guys ready to trust me? And notice what he says. He brings them right back to the same issue that the first generation freaked out over. Once again, it has to do with giants. But listen to what God tells this second generation. He said, Hear, O Israel, you're now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations what? Greater and what? stronger than you. And he's talking about the giants. And you keep reading, it's very clear. And in fact, they got with large cities that have walls up to the what? Sky. Remember last week we saw some of the monuments that we can't explain today? Well, not only did they have greater technology back then that we're only rediscovering today, or still can't explain, but if they're bigger, it also helps explain how they got that stuff moved around. And so God talks about, and literally, so these huge, massive structures, huge, massive people, the people are what? Strong and tall. They're the who? The Anakites, once again, of the genealogy of the giants. He says, you, you know about them, and, and you've heard it said, who, who can stand up against the Anakites? You guys remember the video footage from last week when it kind of depicted some of the fear and the giants were chasing those people? Okay, so that, that kind of gets in your mind. That's kind of what God's saying. He's listening to you. You've heard it said, oh, right? And he's basically saying, don't be like that first generation, right? And he says this, okay. And who can stand up against the Anakites? But be assured today that who? The Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you. Like a devouring fire, he will destroy them. Who's them? The giants. He will destroy them. He will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. So again, the context here is that we have this second generation getting ready to go into the promised land. Again, as you know the scripture, God had to wait for the first one to die off. It wasn't because they got lost in the desert, okay? It's they took laps in the desert because they didn't trust God. Anybody take laps in the desert with God for not trusting him? You don't want to learn this lesson? Take a lap. You're going to learn it again, whether it's six months or a year. Man, that'll preach. I'm sorry, yes, he's going meddling early in the study again, but let's move on. Uh, so that's the first generation. So now he's saying the second generation, he's, he's basically in essence saying, don't freak out, don't be afraid. I know that these are giants here. You've heard it said, you probably heard it from your family members, that first generation, oh no, it's horrible, big grasshoppers. Whoa. 
He said, I know that. But what was the point that he stressed to them? That the first generation should have got. Trust me, I'm going to take care of your giants. As we saw, that's an encouragement to us today. You ever have a giant problem? Trust God. He'll take care of your giants, okay, even today. And he said, be rest assured he's going to take them out. But notice the word that he says there. God, is a, he's going to uh, come in there, and he's going to take care of them. He's going to get rid of them, and they're going to annihilate them, right? So stop and think about this. If these guys are real, these giants, and this is the second generation going up against these giants, and as we know, if you continue to read, the second generation did succeed. They did trust God, by and large, okay? They did uh, take over the land which means they got rid of the giants, right, through God. So the point is, well, wait a second, if these giants are real and they really were annihilated and taken out, then that means they died. How many of you guys can figure that out tonight without any help? And if they died, then you would think that somewhere, somehow, we'd find some remains of these giant people, right? We do. In fact, we find them all over the world. And so what we're going to do is take a look at some of the remains, the actual remains of these giants. Okay, we're going to look at footprints. We're going to look at skeletons. Uh, we're going to look at evidence of giants before the flood and giants after the flood. Okay, both of them. We're going to start off with before the flood. Okay, let's take a look at that. Uh, giant man tracks have been found in Texas in a rock formation that, according to evolution, is supposed to be 120 to 130 million years old. Well, that messes everything up right there. But when they begin to measure these tracks, uh, human tracks, uh, they showed a, f- a foot covering like a thin sandal or a, a moccasin. One fossil print was so well preserved that the impression of lacing was still visible on it. Uh, but some of the tracks were 21 and a half inches long. Listen, had a seven foot stride. Between the next step was seven feet. I'd rip my britches every time if I tried that. Right? It's just, whoa, seven feet. Someone with a 21 and a half inch long foot would have been approximately 12 feet tall. Whoa, that's interesting. Uh, in 1932, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, 13 giant tracks were found by Ellis Wright, and each of them were about 22 inches long. Okay? In the Megalong Valley in Australia, an impression of a large human-like footprint was found in ironstone protruding from a creek bank. The footprint measured seven inches across the toes, and if uh, complete, would have been uh, at least two feet, making the person also about 12 feet tall. Uh, a man named Noel Reeves uh, found near Kempsey, Australia, a series of monstrous footprints in the sandstone beds in the upper McClay River. One print shows a toe span of 10 inches, suggesting the owner of the print may have been around 17 feet tall. Pretty big. Okay, this skeleton is a photograph from a, 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 a newspaper thing. Uh, was found in a coal mine in Italy that was 11 feet 6 inches tall. Very interesting. We're going to see some evidence in some of the evidence here. You can actually uh, see these in old newspaper uh, clippings. We're going to see a video clip tonight of another researcher, and he mentions a website that you can go on and you can look at the microfish and you can look at these older ones. Now they won't put them in the newspaper today. But before evolution began to take a foothold, they printed picture after picture after picture of these evidences. You have to go back to the microfish. And believe it or not, a lot of that uh, microfish is online. You can see that. And it's legitimate sources, by the way. Uh, One report says that the government of Turkey claims to have found the uh, grave of Noah, according to them. The skeleton was over 12 feet tall, which would make his cubit a little uh, bigger. And as one guy said, um, just how big was that ark? If he was really 12. Wow. Wow. You know, well, how could he build that with him and his three sons? Well, you didn't see the size of his sons. Go get that tree, Herman. <laughs> right? you know, or actually, it was Japheth, by the way. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, 1877, four prospectors were looking for gold near where? What? Eureka, Nevada. And upon scanning some of the rocks, they spotted something protruding from a high ledge. So they climbed up, here's a photograph, uh, to get a better look. And what they discovered was a human leg bone and a kneecap sticking straight out of the rock. First of all, what in the world is human remains doing inside of rock? It was during the flood. This was done at the flood. So this is a pre-flood person. Okay, but watch this. Several medical doctors examined the remains and were convinced that anatomically they belonged to a human being, a very modern-looking human being. But the intriguing thing was the size of the bones. From the knee to the heel measured 39 inches, which means the owner would have been over 12 feet tall. So most likely a pre-flood person there. 1833, soldiers were digging a pit uh, for powder magazine in uh, California and discovered a male skeleton 12 feet tall. 
Uh, the skeleton was surrounded by stones, axes, carved shells, uh, and some blocks that were covered with unintelligible symbols. The bones verified the legends of the Paiute Indians, remember we saw that a couple weeks ago, regarding the giants which they called the Saitikas. Okay? It was a, they believe it was a, uh, and what their reports are is a, a red-haired giant race of people okay, who were cannibals, by the way. Okay? Uh, in fact, there's all kinds of reports of giants throughout America and around the world. But once again, they're hiding the bones from us. Let's take a look at that. Mass graves of giants were opened. Some of them, some of the men eight feet tall, some of the women seven feet tall, uh, some records of men 10 feet tall, and extremely large skulls. And extraordinarily, uh, some of these skulls had horns, some had extra rows of teeth, uh, some had other what we would call anomalies, but they were extraordinarily large skulls and uh, extraordinarily large people. A maverick archaeologist who has long been fascinated by legends of American giants is David Hatcher Childress. A number of mounds in the Midwest in America were excavated uh, starting around 1850. And in many cases they would find skeletons of people who were in excess of seven feet tall. And in many cases, they had double rows of teeth, as well as, in some cases, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. The one that was found in uh, Bridal Veil Falls, California, by a group of miners, first they found this wall with very intricate hieroglyphics. They assumed that they were finding gold behind the wall. They broke it down, and they found this woman holding a child covered with fur and a strange kind of dust. The same tall, female, mummified remains have been found in Texas. They have been found in Death Valley. They have been found in other parts of California. These old photographs and newspaper clippings are all that survive of these mysterious giants. Winner of the Newsmaker of the Year Award Journalist Jim Mars has a special interest in speculative science. Archaeology at that time was in a heyday. There was everybody that had a shovel was out trying to find something. But what's interesting is, is that the finding of these giant mummified bodies and giant fossils and bones, uh, really you can't pin to any particular location. They were finding them in Greece, they were finding them in Italy, they were finding them in the Middle East, they were finding them in America, and even if you write off a few of those as perhaps a hoax or a misinterpretation of something else, uh, you're still left with a tremendous amount of evidence to show that there were these giant beings at some point uh, walking the earth. Now one of the great mysteries of the West is what happened to these giants? There was nearly 60 skeletons brought out of this cave, but today they're nowhere to be found. Is it that there is some kind of archaeological cover-up that has occurred here? All right, audience participation for tonight. Uh, repeat after me. No. no. Oh, can you believe that? Yeah, we're going to see that in just a little bit. That's exactly what's going on for the last 150 years years. We'll get to that in just a little bit. 1878 in Ashtabula, Ohio, a man was cultivating the soil. He discovered the remains of bones that uh, he believed to be a race of giants. The skull and the jaw were of such a size that the skull could cover the man's head and the jaw could have easily slipped over his face as though the head of the giant were enveloping his own. Isn't that wild. Uh, according to the San Francisco Examiner, again, you go way back in Microfish, you'll find some of this still in print, uh, that they, uh, they reported a body petrified giant found by two farmers while they were sinking a well 10 miles outside of the town. Uh, the body was reported to have been as hard as flint, petrified, and the body itself was complete except the arms and leg had broken off. Uh, the article states that the veins and ribs were very plainly visible. And later, a group of men were dispatched to retrieve the arms and legs, which were still in the hole where the giant had been found. He was approximately 12 feet tall. Uh, the New York Times, back in 1925, reported how an American engineer found in the, western, uh, mountain, the mountains of western Chihuahua a skeleton of a man that was also 12 feet tall. And all around him were other skeletons, men so big that even in sitting posture, they still rose six feet high, just like columns, taller than me, which I know is not hard to achieve, uh, just sitting 
It was how huge they were. New York Times in 1902 reported how a giant 12-foot skeleton was found, listen, 200 miles southwest of Las Vegas. Anybody ready to start going out in the desert and checking things out? Come on, this is a total guy thing, man. It's, it's, it's right in our area, folks. A lot of this stuff has been found. Uh, the men who opened the grave said, listen to this, that the forearm was four feet long, that the teeth ranged in size from that of a hickory nut to the largest walnut, and the chest was reported to be seven feet in circumference. Huge, massive guy. Okay, 1950s, okay, these are photographs. Uh, during the road construction in the Euphrates Valley, southeast Turkey, many tombs containing the remains of giants were uncovered. At the site, the leg bones were measured to be 47.24 inches long. Joe Taylor here, uh, the director of Mount Blanco Fossil Museum, that's the femur, by the way, there. Uh, the human femur belonged to a giant estimated to be 14 to 16 feet tall. That leg bone is huge. And can anybody guess why that leg bone is huge? It belonged to a huge guy, Jim. Thank you for answering. Uh, and as wild as that is, folks, that is not Photoshopped. These can actually be verified. And there's a lot of other researchers that once you go back in the archives, you can get actual legitimate stuff uh, that is true, like this guy shows. We'll take a look at uh, what's called the Irish Giants. Let's take a look at this. I know that there's all kinds of stuff floating around on the internet, a lot of uh, Photoshop stuff, so I was very careful to stay away from that kind of speculative evidence. And so I found uh, this picture, which was taken from the Strand Magazine, uh, reprinted in C.F. Wood Martin's 1901 book, so it's not Photoshop. You can go and check it out yourself. There's no Photoshop involved here. And he says that the London and Northwestern Railroad Railway Company's Broad Street Goods Depot, in a photograph of which is reproduced here, this monstrous figure is reputed to have been dug up by Mr. Dyer while prospecting for iron ore in County Antrim in Ireland. The length 12 feet 2 inches, girth of chest 6 feet 6 inches, and length of arms 4 feet 6 inches. There are six toes on the right foot, took half a dozen men and a powerful crane to place this article of lost property in position for Strand Magazine, magazine artists. And we also have the New York Tribune, 1909. You can go online and you can look at uh, newspaperarchive.org and you can look at these uh, uh, microfiche uh, copies of these, of these newspapers for yourself. Uh, Ixtapalapa, a town 10 miles southeast of Mexico City, there have been discovered what was believed to be the skeleton of a prehistoric giant of extraordinary size. The skeleton of a human being that is estimated to have been about 15 feet high. Then from France, in a prehistoric cemetery recently uncovered in Montpellier, France, while workmen were excavating a waterworks reservoir, human skulls were found measuring 28, 31, and 32 inches in circumference. The bones that the workmen discovered were also of gigantic proportions. One of the scientists engaged in examining the skeletons says they belong to a race of men who stood between 10 and 15 feet in height. Interesting. Now, how many guys would say, when you take a look at the evidence, that there's plenty of evidence for giant remains, right? Which, again, if the biblical account is true, and there's more truth to the mythologies than we're led to believe, and the histories of various cultures around the world mentioning giants, you would, and if people really took them out under God's command, you would think we'd find some remains. We do, okay? Which leads to the intriguing uh, question. Well, wait a second. If we see these uh, critters in mythology, in the Bible, in history, and we actually find their remains, why don't we hear about this in the academia, in the schools, in the scientific community? There's a conspiracy. That's right, Ryan. There's a conspiracy going on, okay? And the reason I think is pretty obvious, okay? Our skeptical evolutionary society is not stupid. If this specific information got out, what would that do to their history? Ruin it. They'd have to rewrite their evolutionary history. Also, it would disprove evolution. And three, it would give credence to the accuracy, once again, of the biblical account. And you can't have that. Okay? And so believe it or not, folks, they are covering up as much as they're digging up. Okay? One guy called it Smithsonian Gate. And as far as I understand, this guy, I'm not even sure if he's even a Christian, so a possible secular source, listen to what he admitted is really going on. He said, outside the scientific theater... There are a number of skeletons, skulls, and footprints of giants. Even more mysterious is the seemingly unanimous decisions by the keepers of the world's museums and archaeological treasures to keep the physical evidence of giants from public view. Only a smattering of the evidence is available in obscure locations, 
Thousands of skeletons and hundreds of historical reports are ignored. The accepted knowledge among the world's peoples is that giants are creatures of myth and folklore relegated to children's fairy tales, grade B horror movies. He said the reality is that giants were present throughout our history. He says, perhaps not equal in quality, but certainly rivaling in quantity are the archives of the Smithsonian Institution. Now listen to what he says they're doing. Okay, He said, in those archives uh, in Smithsonian, they're only open to government officials, lies the bones of many thousands of corpses dug up, described, and stored without study for more than a century and a half. So this is what they've been doing for the last 150 years. Scores, if not hundreds, of these skeletons are considered giant, and yet they lie deteriorating, not finding the slightest interest from anthropologists wanting no part in rocking the nearly def uh, defined prehistory model, evolution. The researchers ignore them now, and there is no sign they will ever change. Hidden in dark, inaccessible storage is a sad example of scientific domination over social understanding and cultural history. Not to be found in the history books, the science references, or in the classroom is undeniable evidence that a race of giants had a prominent presence. He said, I believe that if only a small part of the Smithsonian gate, that's his words, evidence is true, then our most hallowed archaeological institution have been actively involved in suppressing the evidence for advanced American cultures, evidence for ancient voyages of various cultures to North America, evidence of giants and other oddball artifacts, and the evidence that tends to disprove the official dogma that is now the history of North America. He says the Smithsonian's Board of Regents still refuses to open its meetings to the news media or the public. Why? If Americans, he says, were ever allowed inside the nation's attic, as the Smithsonian has been called, quote, what skeletons might they find? So there's a cover-up going on. They're hiding it from us, and this has been their mandate for 150 years. Why? Because what started about 150 years ago? Evolution. If so they were out there, and remember we saw before in our previous days, they're faking their evidence, but when they find evidence that agrees with the biblical account, what do they do? They hide it away. And so really what's going on is it smells just as bad as the final scene in the Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember that? I want to give you that visual, folks. Let's, let's recall that final scene. They found the Ark, finally made it, it got away from the Nazis, and here's what the scientific community did with this discovery. Let's take a look at that. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. in those boxes. I mean, that's what it leads you with, right? Now, folks, can I tell you something based on the evidence? That's what's really happening. See, that's a Hollywood movie, but in reality, that's what the Smithsonian Institution, the evolutionary academia, is doing. And it makes you wonder, what else are they hiding that agrees with the biblical account? Okay? This is all going on, folks. It's not make-believe, okay? But that's not all. The pre-flood world okay, not only provide the right conditions, as we saw so far, we're dealing with giants, remember, giant ages, okay, the pre-flood world produced that, we saw with the right conditions, giant plants, remember that, trees got a thousand feet tall, amongst other things, and of course, what we've been seeing the last couple weeks, giant people, but folks, that pre-flood world provided giantism for everything, it wasn't just plants, and it wasn't just people, uh, it provided for giant creatures, Mary, does that bug you? Yeah, it bugs me too. All right, but uh, anyway, <laughs> we're going to take a look, folks. Everything got big before the flood. And again, if you were here last week, this is why I'm not uh, a person that say, well, the giants that we see were only a product of the uh, Nephilim that were produced from the angel-human hybrid issue. I think that is one element. And then there will be another camp that says, no, that's too freaky for us to uh, believe in, so we'll just say that it was only because of the pre-flood world. No, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And the reason why I kind of lend towards that and lead towards that, me personally, uh, in researching it is because if it was just people that got big, I could see your point that it was just from the angel demonic issue hybrid thing going on. But everything got big. Everything got big 
in the flood and explains a lot of things, eventually even dinosaurs. But let's take a look at how big things got prior to the flood, not just people. Dragonflies that today have about a four to five inch wingspan used to, in the pre-flood world, have a wingspan of five feet. Five feet, okay? How would you like to hit that in your windshield? Take you, your windshield, everything out, all in one thing. Wow, dragonflies, huge, massive things. Beetles apparently grew the size of baseball gloves. Remember, my brother used to eat back in Kansas on the screen door, June bugs. Hey, what else are you going to do? You lived there, Robert, right? You know how boring it is. They're everywhere, June bugs, right? So he's just speaking, he goes, oh, right? But you know, if Jim lived back then, my brother, he could just eat one and be full for a couple days. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine the size of a baseball glove? Woo, wow. Uh, they also find fossilized cockroaches that one and a half to two feet long. Two feet long. Now, cockroaches are big in Vegas. But two feet long, everything got big prior to the flood. Okay? They also find fossilized crickets and grasshoppers two feet long. Okay? That's a meal. Okay, you would do want to carry a shotgun. And of course, spiders got huge. Okay, here's a picture of a fossilized giant tarantula, one and a half feet long. I hate spiders, let alone that big spider. That's horrible. And they also find fossilized centipedes that are eight and a half feet long. This guy mentions that, oh, nearly nine feet long. Let's take a look at that. And the centipede was found fossilized in Germany that was almost nine feet long. Could you imagine sitting around watching television one night and have him crawl out from under the couch? <laughs> Give you something to talk about for a while. Bats have been found fossilized that were the size of sheep with 15-foot wingspans. You couldn't go outside after dark with bats like that flying around, could you? <laughs> have you seen Uncle Bob? No, he went out after dark the other night. We said, don't go out there, Uncle Bob. He didn't listen to us. We think the bats got him. <laughs> the size of a sheep. Now, have you guys had any bats here in Vegas dive bomb you? When I first moved here... We were in the backyard there, just kind of relaxing. Ah, oh, loving this weather in Vegas. Next thing you know, here comes these bats, man. Right? But can you imagine? They're like that big. Can you imagine the size of a sheep and the wing? 15. Whoa. Everything got big prior to the flood, like the Bible says. But speaking of uh, regards to insects, giant centipedes, one guy says this. Listen, he said, if you uh, took a time machine back, you definitely want to check your sleeping bag before getting in. Okay, number one. But what he also says is what's interesting, you put this together, it agrees with the biblical account, right, for, for insects. He says the insects, they couldn't survive at that size in today's modern air. For an insect to get that big, you would need to have a lot more oxygen. And what did we see in our research? There was more oxygen in the pre-flood atmosphere. Not only that, listen, another researcher pointed this out. Insects have to breathe through their skin, so the only way they could get that size, uh, could have ever breathed at that size, is there would have to be increased air pressure. Well, guess what? There also was an increased air pressure. So mm, once again, it's very interesting. And that's why they don't get that big today, because they don't have those conditions. Okay, Here is a man standing next to a hornless rhinoceros, 18 feet tall, 30 feet long. Okay? Huge, massive thing, okay? Uh, here's also uh, fossilized beavers, eight feet long, which I like this guy's conclusion. He says, if you got bigger trees in the pre-flood days, you'd need bigger beavers to chew them down, <laughs> right? Thousand foot tall trees, eight foot beaver. It's all, you know, works together good. Fossilized fish have been found as long as 72 feet. Not whales, fish. How would you like to catch that one? Bring that baby home. Honey, we're eating for the next year. Okay, uh, those working on fossils uh, say that the species uh, rival the size of a whale. Just a fish, regular fish. Sharks, speaking of which, uh, used to get enormous. Fossilized shark teeth have been found that lengths of 80 feet long. Eight stories. Shark, okay? Makes jaws look like a piece of bait, okay? Pigs grew the size of cattle. That, that'll bring a tear to your eye. Archaeologists also found remains of a giant penguin that was almost as big as a man. Big little guy there. Uh, also, remains of a giant water scorpion over eight feet long. Stay out of the water, is my theory. Uh, they found rodents, rats, rodents, that were roughly the size of an economy car, and their heads were larger than a cow. How many guys like rats? You wouldn't like rats back then either. Uh, speaking of rodents, other ones, uh, similar to guinea pigs, grew to be as big as a modern-day rhinoceros. 
So you need a big exterminator for that. A fossilized donkey was discovered in Texas that was nine feet high at the shoulder. It was nine feet high. Kangaroos have been found that were 11 and a half feet tall. Okay. Uh, here's a turtle skeleton, 10 feet tall, that was at uh, Yale Museum. That'd make a lot of soup, wouldn't it? 10 foot tall. <laughs> Can you imagine that? They also found deer antlers with a 12 feet width span on their horn. 12 feet. For you hunters, go ahead, shed a little tear. Don't show your wife. Can you imagine getting that rack on your wall? Right? Probably ripped down your wall. Okay, but how big was that? Whoa, 12 feet span? Okay, camels have been found over 12 feet tall. Okay, uh, the remains of giant geese weighing more than a half a ton have been found. Uh, speaking of birds, some have been found that are nearly 13 feet tall. Studies have shown that they were able to run as fast as a cheetah, 60 miles an hour. Uh, some of them, they uh, say, had a, uh, kicked uh, their prey with a kung fu style and can swallow a medium-sized dog in one gulp. I leave my dogs inside. Right? I like my weak dogs. Right? And, but that's not all. Here's an actual photograph. Uh, Dr. Kenneth E. Campbell in front of a 25-foot wingspan Argentavis uh, Magnificence displayed at the Natural History Museum of L.A. How many guys would say that's a big bird? Okay, huge, massive bird, okay? Uh, the feather size from that bird is estimated to have been five feet long over one half foot wide. That's just one feather. That's bigger than giant birds today, just the feather, okay? Uh, ground sloths today that only grow to be the size of about a, a monkey have been found in the fossil record 20 feet tall. Okay, I don't care how slow it went, it's still freaky out. Okay, 20 feet tall. Uh, this is wild. Recently, builders found fossil remains of a giant armadillo in southern Peru that was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Can you imagine that? Look at digging it out there. Wow. Okay, in fact, they also found in Mexico the remains of fossil, uh, fossilized flying creature had a wingspan in excess of 60 feet, which is about the same width of an F 14 fighter. Huge, massive, massive birds, okay? Uh, we also find lizards up to 23 feet long weighing over 1,300 pounds, which you put all this together and it leads to a pretty interesting discovery. As one guy puts this, he says this, hey, they, wait a second, this starts to explain maybe the real origins of dinosaurs, you know, terrible lizards. He said if they did live that long, remember everything was longer, hundreds of years old, uh, note this fact, a reptile has the potential of growing throughout its entire life. Unlike other animals, the reptile has no cutoff mechanism whereby it stops growing in size. So therefore, if reptiles today live longer like they did in the pre-flood world, they would have been, quote, dinosaurs in just a few hundred years. So you put a lizard that never stops growing into these conditions with an unmassive limited food supply that produced giantism and you lived long and you never stopped growing... Wait a second, have we been lied about the origins of dinosaurs too? Yeah, and that's why, Lord willing, next week you want to be here, we're going to get into the truth about dinosaurs and take a look at what the Bible has to say about that. But here's the point as we conclude this study. After all these studies, folks, here's the point. I hope you don't miss this. Uh, even as a Christian tonight, uh, the point is this. There is tons and tons of evidence that the Genesis account is real, including the Genesis account that the world was flooded because of sin by God. Right, And so the point is, if you're watching this, or if you're even here tonight, I don't know the heart, but if you're not saved, you need to get saved now. Okay, Because as the people of Noah's day who were real found out when that first raindrop hit their head, oh no, it's too late. Don't wait that long. You need to get saved now. But as Christians, we need to be faithful like Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's being repeated today, Right? God's getting ready to judge this planet, and so he's called you and I to be faithful like Noah and get out there and be a preacher of righteousness. We need to spend our time telling other people about Jesus because there's nothing more important than the Father's business, and we need to be faithful like Noah. We'll close in prayer after this. This is a picture of a fish fossil swallowing another fish. Either that or the little one is a dentist. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, neither one of the fish thought they were going to die that night. The big one had the little one about halfway down, and I think the flood came, and the fountains of the deep broke open, and probably a mudslide covered them up. And they both woke up dead. 
Did you know you're going to wake up dead one of these days? And you're going to be dead for a long time. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Harry Truman, uh, not the president, Harry Truman lived on the side of Mount St. Helens. A friend of mine from St. Louis witnessed to Tim, to Tim Barron's, witnessed to Harry Truman. He said, Brother Hoven, Harry was a very profane man. He cursed every other word. He listened carefully to the gospel and then rejected what I had to say. He turned Jesus down. Sometime after that, the government came in and said, Harry, we believe this volcano is going to explode. You need to move. Harry lived right on the side of Mount St. Helens. Harry said, I'm staying right here. I'm not moving. Well, Harry did stay right there. Matter of fact, he is still there someplace. They never did find him. Probably buried under 300 feet of mud about now. Harry heard the warning and refused. As far as we know, Harry's in hell right now. Now, isn't that stupid to live on the side of a volcano that's about to explode, and somebody comes and tells you, uh, would you, would you move? You say, no, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. I mean, that's, you, that's not too bright, is it? But you know, there's an awful lot of people in America doing the same thing and people in the world doing the same thing. Here we are living on a planet that's going to be blown up. It's going to be burned. It's going to be destroyed. We're all going to die. And Jesus has provided a way of escape. So you don't have to pay for your sins. You can be forgiven. And they're refusing to take the opportunity to be saved. I don't understand that kind of thinking or lack of thinking. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus, you're just not going to heaven. God's not willing that any should perish, it says in 2 Peter. He wants everybody to be saved. You can be forgiven. If you'll ask God, He'll forgive you. I think an awful lot of Christians are going to get to heaven, and they're going by themselves. They've never led a soul to Christ. And they're going to get up to heaven, and they're going to see somebody else who's got a whole crowd gathered around them. They're going to say, hey, where'd you get all of them? And somebody's going to say, oh, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and yet have wanted one. Question, who are you bringing to heaven with you? Who are you bringing with you? Have you led anybody to Jesus? I mean, it's not that hard. Jesus is coming quickly. You ought to lead somebody to Christ. Some of you are here tonight and you're saved. You've never done that. You've never brought anybody to Jesus, have you? You could. You could, if you weren't so worried about the dumb ball game going on. See, the devil has you distracted on things that are not going to matter. What you ought to do is focus on what's going to matter forever. And that's not money, that's not cars, that's not clothes, that's not ball games, that's souls. Everybody ought to hear the gospel, folks. Jesus is coming quickly. Hey, if you died tonight, where would you go? Hmm? You're going to be dead for a long time, you know. You better get prayer prepared for that. Where would you go if you died tonight? If you're not sure you're going to heaven, you ought to get saved. God's judgment. He ruined, folks, it's evident in every place. He ruined this world once, and He's coming to judge it again. And we're all going to stand before God. And it's, praise God, I've got the blood of Jesus Christ taking care of my sins. Or else I'd be in serious trouble. If you don't have Jesus taking care of your sins, well, then you are in trouble. But He loves you. He's willing to save you. See, we're all going to die. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do. But it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen to you too. And you're going to be dead for a long time. Where are you going to be when you're dead? Or if you're saved, what are you going to have to show for your life? Huh? You're going to leave it all behind? Why don't you take somebody with you to heaven? If you can't get you a big one, get you a little one. But get somebody saved. Everybody ought to win somebody to Christ. If you don't know how, learn how. If you're scared, pass out tracts or leave videotapes or do something. <laughs> Everybody can do something. Boy, that flood ought to remind us of God's judgment. Ought to motivate us to get busy and lead others to Christ. I pray that you'll do just that. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. 
But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that, and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn, we, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it, and a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, 
Uh, it, it's a proven fact. They did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a of death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it and they can't earn it. If he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day, that you're still alive. God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.